Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute, we're going to review one of our foundational single leg exercises, and that is the K-Box Split Squat. Just like with the squat, guys, make sure you got that tether taunt when you're at full extension, and set yourself a counterbalance. Here we're going to use the barbell on the rack. Sink it down just like a regular split squat, chest tall, and drive through that front foot. I really like that back plate there to take tension off that back toe. As we progress forward, that's going to be big time to help us even keep our weight forward more. As we increase intensity and decrease volume, we're also typically cutting depth, therefore increasing transfer when we're looking at stopping power at a greater height. Guys, give this one a shot. I'm sure that this is one that you're going to find some great carryover for your athletes. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Before we get to the show, let's play a little game of name association. When I say the names Hank Krasenhoff, Dr. Natalia Verkashensky, Brett Bartholomew, Dr. Charlie Weingroff, Dr. Brian Mann, and Dr. Fergus Connolly, what do you think? Well, if the answer to that was they each have multiple lectures in the Strength Coach Network, then you would be right. On top of these sensational lectures from these six world leaders, we have well over 100 additional lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world, along with an extremely active forum where there's coaches from all over the world discussing everything in the strength and conditioning world. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, that's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS, to dive into all that great content today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of getting to sit down and talk with Darren Roberts about building a culture and a community in the performance realm. Now, after a real quick rundown of how Darren got to where he is today, we dive right into the world of action sports. You know, the uniqueness of these athletes, the uniqueness of the world they're in, and and really how he has developed how he works with these men and women. Now, this includes the exceptional roles of Mario Kart memorabilia and Nerf weapons within his facility. Yep, you heard that right. Uh, you know, guys, and then we really finish off the, talking about the role of autonomy and how he's evolved more towards leaning on the athlete to have more ownership of their entire process to improve their development. This is really... An awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Darren, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Dude, it's absolutely fine. It's um, it's great weather here in Manchester for once. And for anyone that knows Manchester in the UK, it, it rains about 99% of the time. And it's not actually raining. It's actually warm. So uh, it's a great day. Happy to be speaking to you. Brilliant, man. Stoked to get this one down as the joke the running joke was that everybody from England had to give you a shout out at some point during their talk. So I'm fired up that we actually can get this, get this recorded. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I have, I have successfully matrixed this since for most of this year. And then I, I was getting called out directly so often it was like, look, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to cave and come on. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, and the shame of it is, you know, I don't even know if it's going to be that interesting. So, so if any, anyone that's heard my name mentioned before, I hope they're not like really excited or anything because I I literally I don't know what I'm doing and I make it up on a daily basis so so I feel a bit of a I've got a little bit of a you know imposter complex going on but um, well we'll see we'll see how it goes. Well, let, let's get to the bottom of that then. Who is Darren Roberts and, and what are you doing over there and what have you built over there in yeah, Manchester? Yeah. So uh, I work uh, exclusively with action sports or extreme sports, I guess, as people know them. And um, I, to give you the last 20 years, uh, last 25 years in a nutshell, uh, I left home and school at 16. I joined the military. I served nine years. Uh, I left, became a personal trainer. Very, very quickly, I, I began working with rugby teams, both rugby union and rug professional rugby union and professional rugby league. And coming from the military, it was just swapping one uniform for another for me because traditional mainstream sports, especially rugby, is it's the same guys. You wear a uniform, it's the same chat, it's the same banter. So I, I slotted in quite well. 
And then one thing led to another, and slowly over time, um, I started working with Red Bull, the energy drink over in the UK on a couple of athlete projects. And one project led to another, led to another. You know, before I knew it, I was running a performance program for them, and that's all I was doing. And um, that's the last 25 years. There you go, in 30 seconds. <laughs> that's sensational, man. And you've built an interesting little community type situation over there in manchester in your in your facility yeah i mean the action spot athletes are as i always say are world class because they don't do as they're told and if they did do as they they were told then they wouldn't be throwing themselves off cliffs or mountains or any of the things that they do so you really need to understand the person and understand them, understand their community and culture to work with them. And when I first started working with them, I, I, because I'd come from rugby and rugby's, you know, no different to the military to me, I, I did bring that across with me and it, it didn't work. And I did have a very much Sergeant major approach to it and it wasn't, it wasn't successful. And I had a, an outlook and an attitude that if only these athletes trained like athletes, how much better they would be at what they did. And I fundamentally failed to appreciate them as people, them as a person, their emotions, and, and ultimately their, the culture and community that they're in. Because if they, if they loved going to the gym, then they wouldn't be doing action sports either. I think it's, you know, Nick Grantham's got a good good little thing about this about who actually likes going to the gym which is adult PE coaches like us crossfitters powerlifters and bodybuilders no one else likes going to rugby players maybe no one else likes going to the gym and then and these kids did not grow up going to the gym they grew up doing their sport doing their freestyle action sport so I fundamentally failed that uh, I was really unsuccessful with them but luckily uh, I was able to learn from my mistakes and really have a think about you know where I was going with it and um, it's it's you've just got to let go and the athletes in charge be sympathetic to their map of the world which is completely different to mine and ultimately is it about getting them in and getting them in the gym and increasing their five rep max deadlift because if I do that then the only impact I've had on that freestyle athlete is I've increased their five rep max deadlift it doesn't make them necessarily a better snowboarder or it doesn't necessarily make them better a slope style snowboarder slope style skier it doesn't necessarily make them better at anything they do you've just made them better in the gym so um it, it, it took quite a significant paradigm shift but um it, it to get them to do anything they need to turn up so uh, that's where i had to think about the environment that we create what that looks like what it feels like what it sounds like and if it looks like a gym, sounds like a gym, and is a gym, then I don't, they're not going to come. But if it, if it looks like their sport, feels like their sport, and sounds like their sport or their community, then they are much more likely to turn up. And as flaky as it sounds, when you, when you arrive at our place and you, you come in the front door, there's, um, there's, the, there's, some, it's, there's floor to ceiling pictures of, of well-known action sport athletes that, that we work with and that other action sport athletes will recognize uh, because we work with them and we know them. And so if, if, if you're walking up, you can see these pictures and think, well, I know those guys and girls and, and, and they come here. So, so these guys must kind of know what they're doing. And we've got some cool quotes on the doors. I know every facility has its, you know, popcorn philosophy thrown up on the walls, but the, the, the stuff, you know, I went for was, you know, the whole, Edison, you know, there the, the ain't no rules around here because we're trying to achieve something. And there's just stuff like that around, which is just trying to get into the athlete's mind before they come through the door that it's not about increasing your physical capacities in the traditional sense that they might think of it. It's about being really sympathetic to their, to their community. And when they walk through the door, of course, then there's BMXs everywhere, we have a we take Mario Kart pretty seriously at our place, and that's streamed onto it's projected onto the wall. We have a Mario Kart leaderboard, of course. Uh, we have an extensive Nerf gun armory, and uh, 
the, the all the shirts and pictures that are up around the walls aren't just there to look pretty to say hey this athlete's being it isn't that cool each shirt or snowboard or ski or skateboard or surfboard whatever whatever the memorabilia is on the wall is from an athlete that's had a season ending or career threatening injury and has come back from injury and the rules are you're not allowed to put something on the wall of shame as I call it unless you're back to, when until you're back to your sport so the athlete can look at that and go oh I remember them doing that I remember them doing that so each bit of memorabilia tells a story in itself it's not just there to look pretty so they'll walk in someone will be riding around on a BMX there'll be a intensive Mario Kart battle going on that's projected onto the wall and um and then it and then they have to be really on their game because I also have nerf grenades and a nerf claymore mine which is positioned around the place so they they can get nerfed at any moment so you know it just straight away no one's worrying about the training or whatever's going on especially if the if they're injured which more often than not is why they're with us and they're not thinking about the injury they're not thinking about anything like that it straight away it feels like an action sports community that they're used to well that's sensational too because you're dealing with people that like it's not like it's not like a guy on a bike plants and then pops his ACL it's like a a surfer's on a 50 foot wave and gets chucked off this thing and they have to go save him or her. And now not only do you have to put them back together, so to speak physically, but also psychologically to be able to get back up on the board. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we're dealing with, we're dealing with people, you know, with hopes, dreams, desires, doubts, fears, and ambitions. And, the, the 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 physical performance piece as you know snc coaches by trade it, it's a piece but it's it's not the most important piece by far so as you say that the, these athletes they either the line between brilliance and trauma is very thin so it's either high fives and fist bumps or they don't get up now in just over 15 years of dealing with action sport athletes i have not seen a single grade 1 muscle injury or DOMS as I call it. But unfortunately, you know, I have seen some pretty catastrophic injuries. I've been through four fatalities and, you know, it's, it, the, it really is a fine line uh, between walking away and it's amazing and not walking away. Now that's, that sounds a little bit bleak, but, but that's where these athletes live and that is what they do. And that is what they love to do. And they push the boundaries of what's possible all day every day they're always at the very edge of what what is possible and often go over that go over that edge but that is how they create progression so when they walk through the door having suffered a season ending or even career threatening injury the last thing anybody needs is to have that constantly rammed down your throat so you've been with action sport athletes their their sport is their life it's their community it's it it, it it's their very being. So when they're injured, they're not traveling with all the other athletes in the sport, in the community that they otherwise would be. So we need to recreate that community for them. And it, as fla again, as flaky as it sounds, we, we, we take the power away from the injury. So when they walk through the door, they're not thinking about the fact that they've got a broken leg or two broken legs or they've broken the back again. It's, um, it, it, it's about where's the Nerf Claymore mine? Because I don't want to get that in my face. And that, and as, as, as silly as that sounds, straight away we're going in a different direction with returning this athlete to sport because we don't talk about what they can't do. We only talk about what they can do. And everybody can take a Nerf Claymore mine to the face. So, so that is where we start and that is how we carry on. And I know it sounds, you know, a little bit odd, but you, you, you can't, you can't be, you know, stood there wringing your hands going, oh, yeah, this is really bad that you've done this injury and you can't do this and you can't do that. And this massive list of can't do's in a traditional sense of injury management because they're on their own. They're not with they're not they're not with anyone they know or uh, anything to do with their sport. So the more you can recreate that for them, the, the less painful it is for them mentally and as far as I'm concerned, the the more engaged with the process they are, with the stuff that they do need to do, and ultimately, 
they're once they're engaged with what they need to do, then they then they will come back and they will be fine. And they're surrounded by constant reminders of who that's happened with, which is all the memorabilia on the wall, which is why it's on the wall. It's not, like I say, it's not just there to look pretty. And equally, we get all the athletes to work together. So it doesn't matter what sport they are, what the injury is. Uh, or the age difference and that's something that I did bring from the military with me was this everybody works together re- regardless of what's going on and it gets pretty funny because it's like well I've got a broken leg well I've got two broken legs so there's nothing wrong with you and you get this real kind of community vibe going and they all work together and dare I say they've all got smiles on their faces despite what has happened to them and there is light at the end of the tunnel and they know that they can get back and they will get back and like we always say to them you will be back fitter and stronger than you've ever been and you'll be be ready to go and they see other athletes at various stages of the return to sport continuum and they they believe they believe and ultimately they they have to believe in me they have to believe in us they have to believe in the process i think it's buddy morris that says but buddy morris that says um you know Athletes don't care what you know until they know that you care. And, and I care deeply about these athletes and getting them back to doing what they love to do. That's awesome, man. And I think that one thing that's a kind of a common denominator among people who have been in the game a little bit longer, uh, the game that you would refer to as adult PE, um, is this idea of autonomy and allowing the athletes to kind of be more involved in this whole decision-making process. Share with us a little bit about how that kind of came into how you're doing things. Because I think everyone has their own story where it was either an athlete or a situation where it was just, it kind of clicked with that. Yeah, absolutely. And it wasn't so much, uh, you know, go finish work on Friday and then come into work on Monday and, and this, this huge paradigm shift is something that happens slowly over time with lots of different influences on me. Um, but ultimately it, it, it was understanding that, that the, the athletes don't get enough credit or certainly the ones that I work with don't get enough, or I wasn't giving them enough credit for being experts at what they do. Uh, like I say, I, I, I was trapped in this very much Sergeant major approach if only you could squat more, then you'd be able to tolerate this landing better. You better do this better. And I, I, but maybe it wouldn't, and probably it wouldn't. And actually, the time spent doing that with them is time spent away from their sport, where it's affecting their technical and creative creative ability. So actually, what should they be spending the time doing? Well, actually, maybe we need to get you some aerial awareness training. Maybe we need to do some more gymnastic training. And it's just th- not thinking like an adult PE coach and standing there counting to 10 it's it's really thinking a lot wider about what what is performance what does it mean to these athletes the performance in the performance in a theatrical sense so it wasn't sort of some watershed moment for me it was just slowly over time mainly because the athletes weren't turning up and they weren't engaging with me or what I was asking them to do so I could have continued to say well the athletes are idiots they don't listen to anything I say anything I say or come to the realization slowly that maybe it's me, <laughs> you know, it's, it's maybe I'm the problem because if it was just one athlete, it would make sense. But you know, the athletes, most of them are disengaged with me. So clearly, clearly it's me. So, um, it, it was just switching it around to that and then giving them autonomy. Look, we've all hired a car and, um, I don't look after higher cars. I don't know anybody that looks after a higher car, but we all look after our own vehicle, don't we? So giving the athletes ownership of something, that they have control over, and then I'm there to guide them, uh, it makes it work because it's about them. And, and they have so much autonomy in what they do in their sport. They, you know, they've been getting themselves from one side of the world to the other since they were you know, 14 years old. So the last thing they need at the stage in the career when they see me, when they're already best in the world, is me trying to tell them what they should and shouldn't do and how they should and shouldn't do it. They tell me what they should and shouldn't be doing and how they should and shouldn't do it. And that's actually one of the first conversations we have is you're the expert, not me. You tell me what you want and how you want it in your sport, anything you're working on. And I'll tell you if I've got something in my toolbox that can help you with that. And um, it's taking it in that direction. And I appreciate certainly on the freestyle side of things, 
what's the relevance of this or what's the cross, crossover of this to traditional mainstream sport? Um, and I'm not 100% sure on that, other than if you're working with some world-class athletes as a strength and conditioner, you might be the eighth strength and conditioning coach they've worked with telling them something different. So I think it's just being really mindful of where the athlete is in their career, what experience they've got and what they can offer, which is usually a lot, because a lot of the time they know what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And again, uh, Nick calls it positive um, pollution where, you know, let them do some of the stuff they want to do so you can slip in the stuff that you would like them to do as well. And, you know, we were talking before we, we, we came on and I call it hiding the broccoli on the plate. Nobody wants to do physical therapy rehabilitation exercises. Nobody. Nobody wants to stand there waving a rubber band around doing scap retractions. Like no one wants to do that. But unfortunately, that forms part of the process. So that piece of broccoli has got to be hidden somewhere and it's got to be hidden in what the athletes do and how they do it. And that starts with them having control. I love that, man. And I love the fact that you're able to work things in and build things together and give them some autonomy because, you know, we all go to school and we all take classes and we all look at things to talk about, like, you know, these are the techniques that you use for cutting and this is the technique for sprinting and this is the technique for, you know, swinging a bat or whatever. But you, how the hell are you going to tell somebody the technique of doing like a front side 180 or whatever? Yeah, and, you know, with, with some of these athletes, they, they, they sometimes don't know how they do the things that they do. And, you know, we talk about flow states, uh, how everything slows down. And again, the action sports is a very, very broad spectrum of sports, all the way from athletes that I say are completely feral. Uh, which is absolutely fine because that's how they do the best, you know. Like the 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 the, the more the freestyle end, the skateboarders, the BMXers, all the, and then you've got the other end of the spectrum of the athletes who train very very what I would say traditionally, just like you would expect an athlete would. So the supercross BMXers, any supercross moto rider, motocross uh, racer, downhill mountain bikers, cross cross country mountain bike or enduro, they they train. Uh, very very hard and take it extremely seriously and so it's a continuum from that all the way to the more of the feral end and it's just understanding who's in front of you and on the um when when i'm working with young coaches uh, i always say to them you know deal with what's in front of you deal with who and what's in front of you today uh because you don't know when you're going to see them again and there might be and they themselves might be different next week so you just got to take it as is this is the third time I've men- mentioned Nick Grantham for fuck's sake. So, so Nick calls it being a coaching chameleon, and and that, and he's exactly right. Is just changing your your persona, not not persona, but your 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 attitude, your vibe, and just changing it slightly to whoever's in front of you. You've got to be able to speak their language literally, uh, and you you need to know their sport intimately as well, uh, which helps you speak their language for all the different sports. So then let's talk about that back end of the return to to play, return to participation, return to competition continuum that you get to deal with. Because again, like this isn't like it's a group of people that in your therapy, you can sit there and do just some, you know, easy half volleys with a soccer ball or, you know, a little pitch and catch with a baseball or whatever. Like they need to get up on a mountain. (laughs) <laughs> they need to, yeah, they need yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, absolutely. So, how do you, how do you return a big wave surfer to big wave surfing, right? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, because there's not many eighty foot waves uh, in our facility. So, you know, so how do you? And, and you're exactly right. And it's a huge, huge challenge. But the, but that process starts from the day they walk through the door by making them feel part of their community and that they're not missing out on something. Now how they deal with fear, fear management, you know, how they use uh, fear as a performance tool, how they use their creativity and everything else, all those uh, instinctual things that they've got, which are very, very difficult to grasp, that we play and prey on them through the whole time that they're with us. So everything they do, and this comes back to the autonomy because they have a lot of control over what they do, everything's got decision-making in it. 
everything's got autonomy in it. Everything's got an element of, let's say, call it anxiety. Like I say to the athletes, if you're not anxious about what we're about to do, then it's not training, it's exercise. And that's fine. We do exercise all the time and it forms part of what we do. But using emotions and putting it all on them is a, is a key part of them maintaining their creative flair especially when they all work together. Now you get, you get four, you get more than three action sport athletes together, whether it's the same sport, different sports, doesn't matter, different injuries. You put three of them together in a room and um, leave them unsupervised for about four seconds and it will be absolute chaos. And that's exactly how I want it because that's exactly how their sports are. So they start dismantling the gym um, I'm surprised no one's burnt it down by now. You know, it's absolute. And the more of them it is, the worse the worse it is. Or, as I say, the better it is. Because they're doing things, moving in ways and emotion and feeling emotions that they would not do in what I would call the traditional rehabilitation process. And this is about treating them as people, treating them as a human and what they've got to go back and do. Because unlike um, unlike what I call traditional mainstream sports, when a freestyle athlete goes back to their sport in six months or a year time, the sport's moved on. The sport has moved on. So to answer your question about how do we get that big wave surfer back, how do we get the snowboarder back, how do we get the motocross athlete back, it, as difficult as it is, it's still graded like any other traditional athlete that you're turning to sport. So the big wave surfer does not go to Nazare and surf 100-foot waves. Um, they go to Indonesia and surf smaller waves and for so long for a certain amount of time and then there's no reaction and then you do a little bit more the next day and more the next day and it might take a few months but you build them back up it just it just doesn't necessarily look like return to sport because of uh in the traditional sense it's the same with the motocross athletes even if they're a grand prix world level rider they start back on what's called a stubble field doing figure of eights because they've got to get back on the bike because you're exactly right the only way the only sport specific thing for these athletes is their sport. So there's loads of things they can do in their sport, even when injured, as long as it's in a controlled environment. You know, we've got the biggest indoor ski slope in Europe right next door to us. So we can take the snow athletes there just so they can feel like an athlete. And that's the other thread that runs through is we always make them feel like they are, which is action sport athletes. So, you know, the snowboarder, they might not be able to do what they want, but they can certainly throw a snowboard on and get the gear on and feel like a snowboard athlete. The mountain bikers, they might not be able to do horrendous hardcore downhill runs, but they can certainly get out on a mountain bike to a certain level. So we're always introducing the sport to them because, as I say, the only sport specific thing for these athletes is their sport. But it's just graded like anything else. You just have to be really, really, really creative about how you do it. And as I say, it, it's, it's not going to happen in the gym. You might have to send them to another part of the world. They, they will spend a lot of time in a gymnastic gym doing aerial awareness training, you know, they, they, or, or a parkour gym from the creativity side. So there's always something they can do, and it, it is a gradual process. And it also helps them um, understand where they're at. And again, they're in control of it. They're in control of it. They just have a different map of the world. So the... the so, so one of the big wave surfers, an easy wave for him to surf, you know, I would probably kill myself on. So you just have to understand their map of the world, what's easy for them, and that you don't put your own, you know, your own perceptions onto them and slow them down. So so it's it's again, it's what do you think you can do? How do you think you can do it? Can you ride this? Can you do this? Again, talking about what can you do, what can you do, what can you do? I love that, dude. And I, I think that that's another thing that ends out being a real common theme is it's not talking about the can't, but the can. So then yeah, let's yeah, talk about something that you can't do, but could have some good things with uh, people listening. You did work in rugby. Yes. I mean, so I am. Um... Yeah. So I, I spent a lot of time in rugby, um, did a season in premiership football as well. And I think, it, you know, it, it's like I say that the action sports are a continuum from athletes that train, you know, any any decent strength and conditioner would ha wouldn't have a problem working with them. They're super cooperative, take their training extremely seriously, and it forms a huge part of their performance piece for their sport. 
and as and I know I'm repeating myself all the way to the more the feral end where they are they are completely out of control. So I think the common denominator for me is my my biggest learning is 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 the athlete autonomy is speak to them, and we all talk about individualized programming, but is it individual? Is it, is it individual to the person? Not, and, I, and I don't just mean from a position or body type or whatever. Is it, is, what does that person like and what don't they, don't they like? Because you can have the most amazing, amazing periodized program. I don't even know if periodization is still a thing. I don't know if that's still in now or if it's out or if it's back in, whatever. But, you know, the, the, whatever plan you've got, it can be the best plan in the world, but the athlete's got to turn up and do it. And the, the the things that they don't do will have no effect on them. So so what will they do? What do they want to do? What can they do? What what, what works for them? And then you're back to the whole slipping the block broccoli in the plate again and say, well, okay, if you want to do this and this, what about this and this and this 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 cooperation rather than compliance? I I don't want compliant athletes. I want I want athletes that who cooperate. Compliance breeds codependency. The waiting to be told what to do. And when they're out on the mountain or the water or wherever they are, no one's telling them what to do. So I can't, I can't undermine all their undermine all their instincts that they rely on in their sport when they're preparing for it. So they, they those instincts need nurturing. So it's it's again we're back to the athlete being in charge or at least thinks they're in charge and giving them a lot more control over what they do and how they do it. Because if we're going to talk this individualization game, that that's got to be much more than, well, here's some gaps in your physical capacity. So here's a program to address that. And now it's individual to you. It's individual to their physical gaps in their physical capacities, but it might not be individual to them as a person, their background, their culture, their, their whole history of being a person, you know? 100%. I love that, man. And I, and I love that it's kind of been this continuum that's flowed through and brought you kind of back to where you are right now. Uh, but Darren, let me get you out of here on this, man. Where can people see more of what you're doing? Well, so uh, I, I am active on social media. I have to say I spend 90% of my time on short, no, maybe 95% just, just trolling people and myself. So you're not going to really get anything of value. I'm on Twitter as The Real Conehead uh, because there's a lot of fakes out there. I'm also on Instagram as the real conehead and i generally just post pictures and stuff of us just having a great time and lots of nerfing going on because that that is what we do and it's not to make light of the serious injuries it's not to uh, detract from anything that we're doing or like i say make light of it but it's having some humility about what we do and how we do because we all take ourselves far too seriously and we've all got and by all, I mean adult PE coaches, we've all got too far of a high opinion of ourselves and what we do and how we do it. And if it's really all about the athlete, then make it all about the athlete. It's not about me. It's not about, it's not about us. It's about the athlete. So you can follow me on those social media accounts. I do troll people pretty hard as well. Um, but um, but y- y- you can go on there. And, and the door is open at our place. Our door is open for anyone to come and see what we do, who we do it with, and why we do it. Because there are no secrets. There are absolutely no secrets in performance. If it wasn't done 50 years ago in uh, in Soviet Russia, it was done 3,000 years ago in Greece. So the, there's no secrets in performance. Uh, anyone that wants to come to our facility and visit us, we're right by Manchester Airport. All that I ask is that you do a short talk on yourself, your coaching philosophy, and anything that you've learned. So it's a knowledge share. But um, I'm an open book. It's an open book. Because there are no secrets. I love it, brother. And I still got to take you up on that trip over there at some point. That yeah, well, be you know, that you, well, you missed out, didn't you? I told you to come across in June. I, I, granted, I didn't tell you why, but that's part of embracing the chaos. And you missed out. You completely missed out on an amazing day. Yeah, you're not wrong. And uh, <laughs> I also have kicked myself quite a few times for that. I appreciate the salt in reopening that wound. Um, yeah, 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 to yeah. That. But, yeah, no. but I, I need to head over there as well. Obviously, um, it's I need to get my passport stamped up and, and head back across the US. I haven't, I haven't been for over a, a year or 18 months or something. But um, but no, I, anyone's, anyone, uh, you can contact me on darren at harrisandross.co.uk. Um, you can contact me through Twitter. And, like I said, I'm an open book. Uh, I'm happy for anybody to come. I'm happy for anybody to ask me any questions. 
um, about what we do or how we do it. But the main thing is, is, is get up off your asses and, and come and see me. Uh, there's only so much can be achieved through emails and chatting, but please, please come and see me. Come and see what we do. Yeah, well, you better have your passport ready for at least eleven months from now. So, well, we'll we'll see. We'll see. That, that, that could be the beginning of this. Well, this podcast could be the beginning of the end for you. So, um, and <laughs> next year, next year would be the beginning of the end. So, I'd, I'd make hay while the sun shines now for the next eleven months. So, we'll see. Oh well, I'm stoked for it, brother. Well, listen, I can't thank you enough for your time, Darren. Right, I truly dude. appreciate you. No worries. Nice one, dude. Yeah, man. Cheers. We'll be in touch soon. Sick. And a huge thanks to Darren Roberts for spending the time with us today. Guys, just some open, honest, candid sharing from a guy who really is is in a sensationally unique situation and building something that is really one of a kind out there in Manchester. I can't thank Darren enough for being so open and honest with us today and sharing so much. This is this is absolutely sensational stuff. Um, and guys, make sure you're following him at The Real Conehead. Um, and he's not lying. He, he's, he's a pretty darn good troll. He, he, he's... Busted my chops quite a bit as well on there. So he does put out good stuff too, and he does give you a glimpse into what actually is going on in the clinic. So I really do recommend you, you check him out. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.